This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Wait a minute. Was that a little bit awkward? You see, the the gospel of Mark ends at verse 8. Our gospel reading today ends with terror and amazement so great that these first witnesses of the resurrection leave and don't say anything to anyone because they're afraid. Surely, surely that can't be the end, right? There has to be a little bit more or maybe you were kind of feeling like, wait a minute, it, it ends with saying nothing and they're afraid? Isn't this a day to celebrate and share good news? Isn't it good news that they went and told and shouted and proclaimed in places all throughout the world? And yet, we have to realize that it is just as ridiculous and crazy an idea today as it was then to say someone is raised from the dead. There's nothing that sounds more like an overly exaggerated April Fool's joke. It's preposterous and outrageous and altogether unbelievable. In fact, it's it's maybe even foolish enough to be ashamed of. It's scary enough, if it's true, to hide the news. And it's an experience that will likely take a lifetime or more to process the full meaning of it all. Because if Christ is risen, and Christ is risen indeed, alleluia, this changes everything. Everything. Everything is being made new. Constructs and divisions have fallen apart. There's no separation. God shows no partiality, Peter says. There's not even a division between the living and the dead. Because that separation is no longer lasting. As Jesus has been raised, Christ is risen. Here we have women, the first apostles, and they will be the first to proclaim the good news, even though it doesn't happen in this text, because we know they told the disciples and they went to Galilee. It is attested to. All nations are brought together here. There is no longer any sort of division that holds weight. There is no one and no thing which God does not love and reconcile to God's self and to each other. That means you. That means you at your best and at your worst. The mighty Caesar who wields death to maintain control and authority has been thwarted by the lowly, humble healer and rabbi from Nazareth, whom death could not contain, and who has risen from the grave to live forever. Promise is fulfilled. Christ told them 
about his suffering and about his resurrection. And it has all come to pass. So too then should we believe the young man's repetition of Jesus' promise to go ahead of the disciples to Galilee and meet them there. If they are to see Christ, they are to respond to faith, trusting in God's promises that are being fulfilled. So why the awkward ending that leaves us hanging? Why not show us how the disciples went to Galilee and reveal to us the risen Christ? As you know, we hear happening in our other gospel texts. Why? Why not just stop right there at verse 8? Because this has always only been the beginning of the good news that Mark is telling. He told us that back in the first verse of the first chapter. And we are called to go to Galilee and encounter the risen Christ. The beginning of the gospel has ended and the gospel is beginning. You are part of this ongoing story of the revelation of God's love for the whole world and God's offer of life abundant and everlasting. And so responding to God's grace and the faithfulness of Christ, we too are called to respond in faith and go and meet the risen Jesus where he is already waiting for us. Therefore, here and now on your journey of faith, I invite you to experience the risen Christ. Present with us in song and in community, even online community. Present with us in the bread and wine that we share in Holy Communion. Present in the joy of promise fulfilled and in the assurance that love and life win. That they get the last word, not death and destruction. Christ is present with us, the risen Christ, and the offer of peace made to you and by you to one another. And so go on now to Galilee, to all the places where Jesus has lived and moved and healed and fed and taught and proclaimed release to the captives. For it is in these places where we will see and know Christ again. It is in these places that Jesus has promised to go ahead of us and meet us there. Here we will see and know Christ again. We will hear God's call to move on to what is next, to step out in faith and trust the love of God that not even death could defeat. And as you continue out from this place and time on your journey, you will learn to embody resurrection and recognize it all around you. Because I have a feeling you already know resurrection. You have experienced it before. You will recognize it. You'll see it in the person who was able to find life after the death of a loved one. You will feel it as the gratitude for what you have fills you up with joy and compels you to be generous. You will hear it in the stories of generosity that provide food for the hungry, a hug for the grieving, a house for the homeless, a job opportunity, a transplant for someone in need, vaccines during a pandemic. And when you recognize that resurrection, you will begin to embody it as you yourself feed the hungry, befriend the poor, cry out for those who have been silenced, mourn for those who have no more tears to shed, embrace the person who has been told that they are less than or unworthy, walk towards those that others avoid, sit with the person no one talks to, refuse to participate in systems of injustice, embody resurrection by providing hope in the midst of suffering, shining light that drives out darkness, loving with concrete actions that drive out hate. Be the salt you are and spice up the world. Be a positive change. Bring new life. Go to Galilee and to the whole world. Encounter the risen Christ who is everywhere you go, bringing new life to you and to the whole world. And so Mark's gospel 
leaves us with a question. Will the disciples go to Galilee? Will the story continue? Will you continue the story? Will you trust you are a part of this unfolding good news? Will you take that next step into the new thing God is doing? Will we turn our flight instinct into energy to proclaim this radical, foolish, amazing, world-changing good news? Having experienced the suffering and death of these last months, of this last year, will you now also embody the resurrection, the new creation? Because just like the heavens were torn open at his baptism and could not be closed back up, And there is nothing that separates us from the presence of God. And just as the temple curtain was rent asunder when Jesus died on the cross and they could not close it back up because the presence of God and the Holy of Holies was spilling out into the streets. So the tomb, the grave is open. The stone is rolled back and it cannot be closed. God is on the loose. The risen Christ is working right here and right now and has gone ahead of us to Galilee. This is the beginning. And like the end and the middle, it is filled with life abundant and love everlasting. This is God's story. And Jesus is already ahead of us calling again, follow me. Let's go to Galilee, shall we?